I'm going to start this out uh, basically uh, with a little bio, you know, background. Um, where did you grow up? Um, I grew up, I was born in the Hinsdale Sanitarium, which became a hospital. Along the way, we moved to Lake Forest, a suburb of Chicago. Uh, went to University of Illinois, uh, down in Champaign-Urbana, and came up to Chicago and did a, a degree in ministry, uh, and also got a degree in uh, uh, social work. Who, uh, who, who, who shaped your values early on in life to, to kind of put you on this road? In terms of this particular uh, um, effort, certainly my mother and certainly my dad. Uh, along the way, uh, my dad was he's going in for surgery, and uh, I was t driving him to the hospital for an appointment ahead of time. He says, I might not come out of this, uh, but I want you to know one thing. Uh, every day that I've married, married to your mom, I've loved her every day. And that was his gift to me and my brothers. But, you know, there are other people that uh, did a lot. Uh, Reverend uh, Ray Day was a Pres Presbyterian minister who ran a uh, settlement house in Chicago. And when I was in college, uh, I ended up working there uh, for a couple months. And then I went back a second year, and he really got me into ministry, uh, both in terms of doing social work and ministry. And it was uh, at that point that I decided to go into ministry, and uh, got to a McCormick Theological Seminary. And uh, they had a program in where you could do both programs. And he was certainly influential for me. I mean, without Ray Day, I probably would not be in this position. But there are a number of bosses along the way that uh, helped me in so uh, particular kinds of ways. Uh, and I think most of my bosses really helped me. Um, I think you know it's it's, it's really a, a a plethora of of uh, of experiences. I mean, you know, through high school, through college, graduate school, early on in in life, uh, I got into community organizing. Uh, uh, actually, studied a week with Saul Linsky when he was alive. Um, um, did a lot of community organizing. Uh, got into housing. Got into mortgage banking. Became a mortgage banker for four years before I started the night ministry, and it was uh, the night ministry was an organization put together by eighteen churches, uh, Protestant, uh, Catholic, uh, Jewish churches in in the Lincoln Park Lake area of Chicago, and uh, I said, "Well, I have the background; I could do that as well." Because I didn't want to go into mortgage bank; I just wanted to learn how to. Uh, put together an organization, do some fundraising for uh, social service. Did those first two summers that you spent working in the settlement house, how, how did that kind of open your eyes to the need and the challenges that were out there on the streets of a city like Chicago? Well, one, it was an adventure for me to be in the city. Uh, uh, mostly growing up in the suburbs, I uh, would come in the city as a high school student, uh, but in, in to, to be in the city was, was influential, to work in an organization that Ray Day was, was leading, who really enjoyed having college kids come, who enjoyed the the kids in the community in terms of the, the programs. That first year, uh, we did basketball, which I don't know anything about, but we put together a basketball tournament in the community, and the people really enjoyed that. At that particular time, uh, we lived in public housing, and uh, so we got to know people in the community. Uh, they appreciated us as, as well. And uh, I think it was, you know, just meeting folks, uh, enjoying that they have the same kind of visions that other people have. Um, and they just want to strive ahead. Uh, they enjoy the relationships. They enjoy the relationship that I had with folks along the way. And uh, certainly I saw a lot of poverty. Uh, we tried to uh, address some of that uh, along the way. But um, I, mean, it was, I just really enjoyed meeting folks, the kids, the adults, people in the community. And uh, I enjoyed it. What can I say? Well, I get, I get the strong sense that uh, uh, 
as Roger repositions there a little bit. Um, you know, okay. I get the strong sense that uh, you saw them and you see them as people first, not just people with problems. You don't see the problems or the poverty first. Is that, is that accurate? No, I think, it, I think it's accurate. I mean, uh, they're, they're people. And you sort of enjoy what's, what's different about me, what's different about another person, is that in, in many, many senses, uh, they have the same visions as we do. You know, they, they like security, they like to have safety, they'd like to uh, have more money so that they can buy a better house or a car, go on vacations, whatever, whether they're poor or not. They like to reach out to different folks. And so there's a sense in which, um, uh, yeah, I think people do, and whether, regardless of where they come from, whether it's racial, religious, uh, heterosexual, homosexual, whatever, uh, they have the same kind of dreams. And uh, I think my mom really uh, fostered that. Uh, I was the youngest son, and my older brothers would say, uh, well, you're the youngest, you should do the dishes. Well, so I always do the dishes, but my mom would be there. And so we get into social commentaries in terms of what our older brothers, my other brothers would do. And so we explored a lot of things uh, in the community, uh, looking at the news, uh, the newspapers, whatever, uh, really expanded my horizons to different folks. And, and my mom uh, may have her own pre prejudices, but she never shared them with me. She said, who do you like? And so I think that was really important for me as well. And <coughs> you would have been coming of age in the civil rights era as well. Um, absolutely. Uh, someone was uh, saying recently that, what age would you like to be in? And someone said, oh, I'd love to be around in the 60s. And I said, well, I was there. You know, I mean, that's when I went to high school, went through college, started my graduate school. I guess I was in school most of that decade. Um, and was certainly involved with, with things uh, at University of Illinois, certainly in terms of uh, civil rights movement, but in terms of the anti-war uh, demonstrations. Uh, there's a lot of activity to be involved with. It was, you know, the 60s was an important period. You, you talked a little bit about how uh, the churches were coming together to, to meet this need in Chicago to, to found the Knight Ministry. Talk a little bit more <coughs> in detail about that. Uh, how did this movement get started? Um, to, to try and uh, uh, address the issues out on the street. In terms of the night ministry. Yes, that's yeah, um, um, I was actually a member of one of the churches that brought it together at that time. And uh, a, number, a, a member of uh, another church was uh, working in some of the bars late at night, saving money. She was going to uh, do a uh, nurse midwife midwife and uh, she went to her pastor and said there's a lot of people out night who certainly are entertaining themselves but there's a lot of people who also have a lot of distress some may be even suicidal and how can the church reach out to those people in terms of providing some kind of social service and she went to her pastor and he was intrigued by it and they got together three three pastors and said what can we do about this and so they said well we need to get more people involved, and they went out and, and got about 18 congregations together and said, what, uh, what can we do in terms of a, some research? And one of the pastors spent a summer looking at some of the social service agencies, went out into the bars, saw something, you know, it was a 24-hour community, and a year later they brought together a, a little bit of funding from themselves and from their denominations, and let's hire someone. And uh, uh, certainly they'd like to have someone who's a clergy person, but they weren't looking to start a, a church. Uh, they come from their own sort of faith-centeredness, but nonetheless, it could be interfaith. Uh, and uh, that was really important. And so um, along the way, someone said to me, Tom, you're looking to make a change. Why don't you apply for the night ministry? And, Eventually, uh, they hired me. One thing that's a bit of a thread there. Okay. I don't think that's a big deal, but I just, just saw it. <laughs> I'm going to get that sucker. Um, so, 
this is what, 1976 there? 1976. Uh, we started, my first day of work was uh, July 16th of 1976, so we're right on target with that. How did it start? What did you do? They, when they, they asked me to uh, go out and see what's happening. They did not tell me exactly what to do. They, they expected me to go out five nights a week, basically Monday through Friday, late at night, um, and see what's happening. They did not wait. To, they didn't did not want me to be a number, another church or anything. They wanted to do talk to folks, uh, get involved with them, develop relationships with them, in terms of helping them with their own kind of issues. And uh, they said that I should take some uh, uh, go down to do a uh, clinical pastoral education program at one of the hospitals, and I did it at University of Chicago. So that first half year, I, I worked half time at uh, as a CP uh, student, and then worked half time on the street. Uh, we met every month in terms of how am I doing? Did I meet new people? What are the issues out there? Uh, who am I counseling? Uh, and they also said if there's a group of folks, certain di identity, uh, who are they? What's their uh, what are their issues? What are concerns that they have? Come back and tell us about that, and maybe we can do something for them as well. And uh, at first, I was just trying to get to know what the street was doing, and it, and it took me a long period of time. I mean, I'd go out at night, I'd meet folks, and occasionally I might run into problems and, and whatnot. Uh, but along the way, they said, you know, dress in any way that you want. And so, for my tradition, we do not dress as a clergy person. It's not part of my religion. Uh, but along the way, some of the bartenders said, you need to announce that you're out here. You need to put up a, a marker uh, some way and say that you are a minister that people can talk to in terms of, of, of particular issues. And they said, if you can't buy it, we'll, we'll loan you the money so you can get a shirt. A clergy shirt. I said, I can handle that. And uh, so I got, got a clergy shirt and went out at night. And even though I'd met a lot of folks and told them what I'm doing in terms of the night ministry, uh, they said, oh, you're on duty. And I said, yes, I've been on duty and I get actually get paid to do this. And they said, oh, well, then I can talk to you about my issues. You know, and so uh, at that point, things sort of turned around for me. And uh, at, at first, everyone would say, what's a minister doing in a bar? Because mostly when I was out, I'd go into a lot of bars. And um, people would say, oh, he, he's, he's, he's uh, begging for money, or he's wanting to preach to us, or maybe I can you know, get married over the night and to this young woman over here, and they'd uh, pay a lot of jokes on me. And uh, that always happened, and you get over that, and you get into conversations with folks. And uh, you really get into what, what are the relationships and what are the issues. And uh, so that's a lot of I did, you know, that first year in particular. Well, what issues uh, really spoke to you from what, what, from what you saw out there on the ground, so to speak? Say that again. What, what were the issues that, uh, oh. that presented themselves? Who, who needed... Uh, who needed help and who needed uh, uh, counseling, needed uh, maybe to be put in touch with someone who could uh, give them more help? Yeah, I mean, the people I'd run into all had their own particular problems. I mean, some people may be dealing with alcohol or drugs. It may be a relationship problem. It may uh, be uh, they're getting divorced, uh, issues of dealing with their own kids. A lot of people said you need to re relate to folks in terms of their own kids. Uh, but I think there, there are a couple things that really struck me uh, along the way. Is, and one is the sense of loneliness. Uh, and I think I may have meant, talked about that before. And, and uh, Mother Teresa was in Cincinnati uh, in 1977. And they had an article that said, what's worse than the hunger that she has done, or in terms of medical things, what she has done, What's more difficult, which is more of a poverty, is loneliness. 
And I thought about that a long period of time, and, and she was really poking, pointing to the United States and the Western world in terms of how, what do you do? I mean, you can get all the, all the resources you want, but what does it do for someone who's lonely? And, and I looked at folks and said, you know, there is a loneliness kind of thing. And uh, there's a couple times of the year, particularly someone who's lonely, is, is one is their birthday, and no one's celebrating in, a, in, a, in some kind of way. And it's also around Christmas, whether they're Christian or not, there's that celebration in the community. and Everyone is happy except me. And you could go into a party, you can go into whatever. Uh, and if you're lonely, it doesn't matter how much celebrating is going outside, what's happening to you internally. And that loneliness can really be, you know, it's, it certainly is a drag on an individual, but it really gets them into the depth of who they are. And, and it may lead to drugs as a way of covering up the loneliness. It may get into sexual dysfunction uh, or abusing folks uh, in some kind of way. And it's, it's sort of covering up loneliness. And uh, if you can develop relationships that are sincere, you can maybe address some of that. And, and that certainly was, was one of the things that struck me early on. Along the way, I saw that there were kids on the street also. I saw that there were high school kids, uh, teenagers on the, on the streets. And I'm talking about, you know, not at 10 o'clock, but at midnight or 2 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning, I see kids. And uh, at first, I, was, uh, I wasn't sure how to, uh, how to meet them. And finally, I said, just say hi. You know, and um, and I met them, and some of the kids were involved in a uh, sex trade, and I said I'm not interested in that, but I, I'd like to get a cup of coffee. If you want to get something? Let's have a meal together. And they said, Yeah, I could do that, and so I buy them a meal, and we get into a conversation, and you know, they may not talk about what they're doing, but um, uh, you know, where 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 are these kids who are out there on the street? And they said, Well, some of the kids go to uh, a juice joint. Uh, where there's no alcohol, and I went to one of those juice joints, and it was a place that would stay open till three o'clock in the morning, and uh, or maybe it was six o'clock. It was late at night, and uh, I said, "Why are these kids here? I mean, they should be at home." Well, these are kids who didn't have any place to go, and the one juice joint I was going to, they actually was closed down because the guy who was running it was uh, getting the kids involved in pornography or into uh, uh, prostitution. And, uh, but I got to know some of the kids. And uh, one of the kids sat me down and said, you know, let me just tell you my life story. And he did from the time he was like five years old until he became homeless as a, a teenager. And uh, at the end of the conversation, he said, we need your help. We want your help. You need to reach out to us. And at the same time, there also was a 15-year-old on the street uh, in the newspapers of Chicago, 15-year-old who ran away from home and was picked up by someone who was murdered and, uh, and, and really slaughtered. And it, was, it was awful. And a uh, policeman involved said, you know, the only people looking for runaways are people who want to abuse them, pimps and pedophiles. And I said, well, I'm looking for them as well. And then I looked around and saw there's only a few folks who are looking to help them, but there are a lot of people who want to abuse them, and we need to reach out to them. And so, you know, certainly uh, I went to my board of directors and said, we need to do something about that. We need to pay some attention. This is a group of folks who have particular issues, and what can we do for them? These are people we meet at night on the street, and how can we help them? And so we got involved in that. And it was at that point that uh, I said, I can't do this alone. And, you know, I mean, I, I worked with a lot of adults, and I could certainly work a lot with kids, but I can't, I can't do both. We need to expand the night ministry. And they said, take some time and uh, get some, raise some money. And we did. Uh, and it took a long period of time because I, we hadn't done much. We, we had a couple uh, events. We raised money. We related to churches and bigger churches, but how can we grow the staff? And we went to the Chicago Community Trust, and, uh, and, and it took a while, but they finally gave us a grant 
to hire a staff person to work with homeless youth on the street. And at the same time, I hired a student to work with homeless youth. And uh, at that point, I got involved with some of the seminaries in terms of doing internships. And uh, I said, well, we need to reach out to these uh, t kids on the street, but they need a place to stay. What can we do? And I went to some of the social service agencies and he said, that's nice, but we can't do that. And so I went out and raised some money to do a foster care program for homeless teenagers. And, and we got five churches involved. We got five families to do foster care. And we grew the organization. And uh, along the way, and it was always a up and down kind of, of a battle for us to, to get the money, but we kept growing the organization. And uh, certainly around homeless youth, we uh, did a bus and did health care. Uh, with adults. Uh, we certainly went into some of the bars and community places, but we grew the night ministry beyond the one neighborhood we started in and uh, decided we can go into other neighborhoods. And we see grew the organization and, and now we're at a point where we are, are in uh, about 10 different communities with the bus that does health care. We have a new shelter here uh, that'll be opening soon. Uh, we're expanding the shelter and doing transitional living programs. Uh, we're doing uh, um, case management with about 80 to 90 kids over the course of the year, teenagers who are homeless or are home, almost homeless, and we do case management in terms of getting them health care, a lot of life skills. We kind of are mentors for them uh, along the way. We're doing a drop-in center with another organization in, in the city. Uh, we do that five, night, five uh, days a week. So there's a number of ways in which we can reach out to different kinds of folks. How many, uh, how many people are working? Oops. Uh, shelter program open? We first started our shelter through a foster care system, and that was in 1987. Uh, when we, we got some money uh, to do the first shelter, we did that in uh, 1992, and we closed down the, the, fo uh, the foster care program, but now we are taking in 16 kids uh, along the way, and we've probably sheltered, you know, 2,500 kids along the way. And uh, so that shelter from 1992 to the present is about 14 years old, and we're uh, starting this new shelter uh, very soon, and we'll do a trans transitional living program as well, adding eight beds. When, when a young person comes here, uh, uh, it's kind of a two-tiered program, as I understand it, transitional living, and then there's a more long-term care, right. long-term re long residency uh, program here. Uh, the kids who come here, uh, you know, one of the things we want to do is to get a kid off the street. We don't want a lot of prerequisites to get them in. If we have a bed open, let's take a kid who's between the ages of 14 and 21, and they're homeless. We don't care about anything else. Uh, certainly, you know, if, if they're drug addicted, that might not be an appropriate place for them. But uh, if they're 14 to 21 and homeless, we'll take them in. Um, and then we'll get them a case manager in terms of, we may have kids who come with nothing, their clothes on their back. Other kids may have bags of things. Um, and uh, the kids come from, you know, certainly from the neighborhood, they come from Chicago, they come from the suburbs, but we've had kids from throughout the country. We've had some kids come from out, uh, from the United, out of the United States. And uh, along the way, one of the things we want to do when they first come as an emergency person, a transitional program, is uh, what are we going to do later on? Because it's not a matter of just signing up and getting into something. We have to find that bed for them. And so they may come here for four months and before we find them that next uh, place for them to stay. Now that we have the transitional, transitional living program, at least we have eight beds that can, kids can go from here into that particular program. So it'll be a process, are they ready to take care of themselves? 
and are you know because there's different different demands for them. You know they have to. Uh, if we, we would hope they'll finish school. If not, work on that. They certainly have to get a job and begin to save some money, so that when they do leave, they have some money that they can go out and uh, rent an apartment and whatever. It's really, it's really trying to get a foundation under them, I guess. It is. I mean, I I think of my own kids, um, and and uh, actually, I got involved with this when my first kid was born, and I said, uh, I'm meeting kids who are 14 years old. What what will happen to them when they're 14 years old? What if in some way he runs away or I'm not a good parent? Who's going to take care of them out there? And, uh, and I said, we need to do something for those kids. Unfortunately, my kid's much older now and taking care of himself. But uh, my other kids, you know, have come back. You know, they've finished college, but they, they come back and stay for a couple of weeks. They may say several years. They have that foundation. These are kids who don't have that, but they need that nonetheless. They need someone, and, and particularly if they're 14, 15 years old, whatever, they need to have that foundation right now. Uh, even if they're 18 or 20 years old, they still need to have that foundation. You know, How do you make decisions in terms of you go into an apartment and the landlord wants you to set, do something? You know, how do you gauge that? Do you do it only on your own, or do you do it in conversation with someone you trust? And, uh, you know, we unfortunately become some of that, but we become a, an extended uh, family as well. We do aftercare. Uh, we have a person who works just on aftercare for kids who are from the shelter, or kids that we meet on the street, because we see hundreds of kids who don't come to our shelter but nonetheless are relating to us as well. And uh, so that's really important. So, you know, it's, it's far beyond just the physical structures of, of, the, of a shelter like this or the other one. You're actually, through the bus and the uh, other programs, you're out in the neighborhoods on a nightly basis, daily basis, right. working with kids. Yeah, I think, you know, it, um, you could say as a social service agency, we have a particular thing. We do housing, we do some case management, we do some health care. We do that certainly for kids. We do that for adults as, as well in terms of health care and whatnot. Uh, but there's more than that. You, you think in terms of a, a professor who, who wrote a book called uh, Bowling Alone and saying that um, when you go bowling, you need to have a team. You can't just go do it yourself. You have to go out and develop those relationships. And uh, otherwise, you're going to be bowling alone, and that's not much fun for you. You need to do more than just have a social service, but in terms of what are those, those other connections for folks. And uh, I think that's really important. We do that, again, at the shelter. We do it on the bus. We do it with health care. Uh, there's so many different ways that you connect with folks. Uh, you go out on our bus. We have a nurse who's a nurse practitioner, very skilled. We have a doctor who supports them, and uh, they do a lot of health care. But they also meet folks and say, where'd you sleep last night? What are you doing about that? Uh, or if you have the flu, how do you take care of yourself when you're out on the street? And it's not just taking care of the illness, but what's what's happening for you as an individual and so the nurse is there but we also have counselors who who meet folks we do a lot of hiv testing for folks we have a lot of education around hiv and aids certainly other kinds of diseases as well but we get in terms of of other programs you know we can meet you at night and provide something but what are you going to do tomorrow can we connect them with that can we get them involved in healthcare uh, thing, not just the bus that comes out two nights a week, but you know, uh, on a regular basis. Um, you know, you look at the bus that goes out, and uh, recently people have been uh, saying in the news media that emergency rooms are getting overcrowded, and even if you have money, you may not get the proper attention because people are going because they don't have insurance, uh, they don't have they may go over there for prevention rather than emergency. And that kind of make, takes away from the emergency uh, atmosphere, but people are, are there. We can do that at our bus. We can do some of that prevention. 
Uh, if they have an emergency, we can get them into a hospital very quickly. Otherwise, we can take care of them. We we'll do a lot in terms of long-term health care for folks as, as well. And so our staff really focuses in on that. Uh, and so it's, it's not just an individual service, but the personality. You know, how can you meet folks? Uh, people see our bus and they're, they're saying, oh, I'm not interested in them, or they don't know what we're doing. But they may see us, you know, the next week, next month, a year later, and say, I think I can trust them. I can talk to them because we've been doing the bus since 1989. Uh, we've been doing the shelter since 1992. Uh, we've been on the street for 30 years. Uh, you know, we've, we've done that every week throughout the year. Uh, so, yeah, it's important. How, uh, how, many, uh, how many staff do you have, volunteer and, and paid? We have about 65 staff people at the night ministry. Uh, probably about 55 of them are full-time. The other are part-time at the, the shelter. We uh, have four to 500 volunteers who come on a regular basis, but there's other volunteers who might just help once or twice a year uh, uh, behind the scenes that we, we don't necessarily recognize. And uh, so, yeah, there's, there's quite a few. And we, we've, we've certainly grown that because we've, we've raised the money to get uh, uh, particular expertise. I mean, uh, that's, that's really important. Uh, volunteers come, and some of the volunteers will work once, once a week. Um, we have a 80, 88 year old woman who goes out at least once a week for us on the bus. Um, we started, uh, something around the Christmas holidays in terms of stockings for kids that was started by a 15 year old, uh, as, as a project. And she become a long time volunteer. Um, you know, I think with, with, without those volunteers, we wouldn't be able to do as much as we can, we can do. And so the volunteers really are important for us. Where, where does the support come from? Our support for the night ministry comes from a number of sources. Uh, originally, it was individuals and churches, but we've certainly grown beyond that. About a third of our support comes from government agencies. Uh, we get some foundation support, which is about 40, 50 percent of our budget. We have individuals, provides 10% of the budget, and we need to get more individuals. We need to, uh, to increase the, the personal givings as, as well in terms of the kind of work that we do. We have a, a golf outing, we have a dinner, you know, special events. Uh, and nonetheless, you know, at this point, we've, we've, it adds up for us. Um, one of the things that, that strikes, strikes me is uh is the amount of need, the level of need that is out there. I, I, I follow the uh, Heartland Alliance's poverty summits that they, they right. publish every year. And the latest one says that something like one, more than one in five Chicagoans lives in, in poverty. Uh, and it seems to be off the radar of most people. One of the things that uh, the Knight Ministry does, and I'm not sure everyone recognizes this, is that we go out in, into people's neighborhoods, into their neighborhood. It's not our storefront or whatever, but we go into their neighborhood. It could be their living room, so to speak. And we take experts out there. We don't have people coming in to see the experts at our, our shop. We, go, we take the experts out there, whether it's counselors, whether we do case management. Certainly in terms of the shelter, we have a particular position, but in terms of the bus, we can take that to any community around the city of Chicago. And um, uh, so we are taking experts out there and we treating people right then and there. It's not setting up an appointment and say you come in a certain time, we'll do it right then and there. And I think that's really important. And um, I think that's, that's just another way of meeting folks and it's meeting people maybe at the bottom line of, of uh, the community. And, uh, and we see them and uh, help as many of them as we can. When, when this started some 30 odd years back, was there any, uh, any idea in your mind that it could ever grow to anything quite like this? Um, not really, um, but nonetheless, I really enjoyed being on the street. And uh, um, 
I really enjoyed meeting folks. Uh, in some ways, I'd like to be back on the street rather than running the organization. But, um, and, I, and I did the street. I was the only staff person for 10 years. Somewhere along the line, I need to, to move on and get off the street. Uh, but someone said, you know, you're not done with the night ministry. And uh, you can get the other people involved in it. And uh, you, have, you, you, you talk about it very well. At least that's what they thought. And uh, that's really important. And if, if you can stay at it, because you, you know the street, you've met folks, you've been involved in all kinds of situations, uh, but can, can you get other people involved? Not just hire them, because people would like to do that, but can you raise the money? Can you develop an organization? And um, Night Ministry Board said, you know, if, if you have a group of folks, maybe we can get other people involved. Um, and I think, you know, we've, we've done that, you know, in terms of, of uh, you know, homeless youth, in terms of health care, other kinds of things. We've, we've grown it. So we've gotten the seminaries involved. We've got uh, schools of social work involved. Um, We've gotten uh, people, whether they're from churches or non-churches, involved because they have the same mission, which is to, cre to create relationships with people who meet at night and to help them meet their own needs. And uh, so I think that's, that's really important for us. What do you see as the next challenge or the next uh, hurdle you want to try to clear? <laughs> um, we all love world peace and those kinds of things. Uh, and there's a sense in which, you, you know, you, you at least you, you do whatever you can. Um, in terms of the night ministry, I think, again, we need to, to certainly continue support. We need annual support. Uh, it, it's getting more difficult for us on the government level. Uh, you go to foundations, they change their rules every year. Uh, we need more individual support, individuals who can, can help us out with that as, as well, just to keep us moving ahead. That's, that's really key. But there, there are other things. You know, one of our, our sort of dreams is to develop a training institute for doing street outreach with folks, develop a curriculum in terms of folks. How do you go out and say, the first thing you have to do is be present, get to meet folks, get to know the community, not just the, the, the folks that you enjoy, but you need to meet the p different parts of the community, some of the power brokers that sort of make up that community. Uh, and, and there's other kinds of things that you can do. Again, developing a curriculum um, to get more people involved. Uh, some people come up and say, you've been doing this for 30 years, and uh, boy, I admire you. Well, I don't know. I, if, if, if they should admire me or not, I, you know, uh, I've enjoyed this. I've, it, it's really been theologically important for me. Uh, it's uh, good for uh, all the people who've been part of it. Um, and if we can do that in, in, in more kinds of ways, I think that's a big step for us as, as well. How would, Tom, how would, you, how would you describe the personal philosophy that you've applied to this? I mean, you could go back and find it in Scripture, like in Matthew, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was a stranger and you gave me, uh, you welcomed me. You should uh, go down on our first floor here and they have a plaque that says, um, from the Old Testament, uh, when you raise a kid in the way he should go, um, and I'm probably not saying this correctly, <laughs> uh, when you raise a kid in the way he or she should go, when they're older, they will not depart from it. And if you raise them with hate, they'll, they'll do that later on in life. But if you raise them, raise them with love, they'll always come back to that. And uh, I think love is the, the key for creating, you know, um, for individuals, but it's uh, needed for the community as well. There needs to be that sort of sharing with one another. Um, Part of me has understood along the way that uh, if I need to get ahead, I need to do it on my own. And that's partly true. But, you know, when you're born, you know, unless someone picks you up, you're going to be on your own. But there's a sort of a gift that parents 
raise you. And that doesn't happen for, there's some kids who maybe don't have that, but most kids are raised by their parents. And along the way, you meet other people in terms of having a relationship with that individual. And, but there's a sense of, there's a gift um, that says, yeah, we can meet. We have some sense of trust with one another, some kind of integrity. And we can uh, lift one up in terms of integrity. And uh, if we keep challenging ourselves to do a little bit more, a little bit more, uh, that's really crucial. I think there's another thing that's important for me, and one is I want whatever I want, I want it now. But you also have to have, have a lot of patience. And I'm going to continue to address it as, as something that needs to happen right now. But I need to also be patient that it may take a long while to grow that. And um, I don't know where we would have started in the night ministry, you know, 30 years ago or 25 years ago. Uh, but along the way, certainly the night ministry has grown and has affected a, a lot of folks um, in ways that, you know, we'll never know about. But uh, nonetheless, it's, it's really had a, an impact um, on individuals and it's had an impact in different communities. And we've seen some of our own volunteers take some of these, go to areas of Russia or into Taiwan or into uh, uh, Brazil. We had folks come and do those kinds of things as training institutes. And we've had a lot of folks from around the world come and meet with us. Hopefully some of what we've shared with them and something they've shared with us uh, can uh, create a better community.